Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Wine's World. And I will admit up front that my chronology is going to be a bit strange because I'm actually recording this on Sunday the 9th and I'm going to be talking about tomorrow which is um, Plough Monday um, but it will be yesterday by the time this airs on Tuesday and so it may all be a little bit scrambled but you get the general idea that Epiphany has passed, that was the 6th and now this weekend and subsequent weekends in pretty much every Catholic region that I know of there's going to be some street carnival and that's going to continue all the way to Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday this year is quite late, it's March 2nd. Ash Wednesday is normally in February and sometimes it's pretty early, it's around the 15th or so. It's late this year which means that the day before Shrove Tuesday, Mardi Gras, it's also late, it's going to be March 1st and so we've got a long 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 period to go here. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to talk about all of the things that happened between Epiphany and Ash Wednesday in this period because it's so long. But I am going to talk today about two most important festivals that is Plough Monday which is the Monday following Epiphany and so it shifts and Distaff Day and Distaff Day can be either the day after Epiphany that, which means it's always January 7th if it's Distaff Day or it can be Distaff Tuesday in which case it's the Tuesday following Plough Monday. Now let's talk about those two celebrations. All right, now the first thing I want to clear up is that when I talk about English or British calendar customs, I need to be careful not to suggest that these calendar customs are somehow universal. That I'm going to talk about Plough Monday, I'm going to talk about Distaff Day and Distaff Tuesday. There never was a time in England where Plough Monday was a thing all over England and it wasn't much of a festival even in the places where it was celebrated for very long. The folklorists and, and, and people in general who like these things like wassailing um, when people go out and shoot their shotguns into apple trees and sing wassail songs and so forth. They do it a lot nowadays because they think it's fun. Back in particularly the 19th century when most of these customs were active they were heavily localized. <clears throat> well, Plough Monday is something that you would have found mostly in the farming regions of East Anglia. That is the area around Norfolk, Suffolk, um, Cambridgeshire and so forth. Just that small part, the very eastern part of England. Not universally, you're not going to find it in Hampshire or Cornwall or um, Somerset or whatever. They've got their own calendar customs and they're distinct from these. So that's number one. Like Distaff Day, Plough Monday and so forth are now more common than they ever were because people have in a 
I was going to say resurrected or revived them, but they're not even resurrected because they weren't alive to begin with. <laughs> they, they were around in very small regions. So let's talk about Plough Monday first, because that's the one that, that I um, know most about and um, observe in some small way. I mean, like Plowman, I'm not a plowman, never have been a plowman, don't intend to be a plowman, so it's not something that I can legitimately claim to have ever celebrated in a traditional manner, A, because I'm not a plowman, and B, because I don't live in East Anglia. But I like to have a continuation into Carnival of um, celebrations, and this seems like a good one. So the Monday after Epiphany, I do something like plowman-ish, <laughs> if you like, and that involves cooking, of course. But traditionally what happened was that on the Monday after Epiphany, the plowman, <laughs> instead of going back to work, that was supposed to be the day that they said, okay, now Christmas is over, off to work, and they said, Okay, well, all right, well, let's have a holiday first. And so uh, in some regions at some time or other, the, the plowman would take a plow and decorate it with ribbons. And they would put ribbons uh, in their hats and on their um, shirts and so forth and carry the plow from house to house and ask for money. You know, so they'd say, you know, penny for the plow, or penny for the plow jack, or whatever. And, of course, they were, had mostly been out of work, so they didn't have a lot of money. And um, people who had a little bit to spare would give them something. Um, maybe the manor house would invite them in to have um, something to drink, maybe some uh, cheese and bread and what have you. But the story is <laughs> that if, if they went to a, a big house and, and the people said, uh, go away, not interested in beggars, they would yoke up the plow, not with oxen, because they didn't have oxen with them. The men themselves would yoke themselves to the plow and they'd plow up the lawn. <laughs> now, now, this has only been attested once and it's claimed falsely that they can they can do it and get away with it because it's an old habit that goes back into what is called legally time immemorial now i'm not sure i'm not a lawyer so i don't know exactly when time immemorial began but it may be um before magna carta don't know but it, it just means that it's always been we've always done this and in English law, that principle is very important uh, because there are land boundaries, there are um, payments, uh, all kinds of things that have been done year after year after year. And they can be honored and uh, you can be prosecuted for not doing them if they've been going on since time immemorial. So that's the claim <laughs> that that these plow jacks or plowmen can do whatever they want on plow monday because it's an old charter it's been done since time immemorial i don't think that would fly but there are at least well there's one record of them doing this or there's one hearsay of them doing it i, I don't know whether they actually did it or not but they continued doing this into the early 20th century and it became, as did a lot of traditional customs, associated with children. So you can see here, uh, I don't know what the exact date is, but these are children in East Anglia with a plough going around houses asking for money, the householder you know, giving out maybe a penny or something like that. Um, and the same was true of maypole dancing. Maypole dancing was done by adults in the 
18th and 19th century. By the 20th century, it was being done by children. That, that there was a general infantilizing of folk traditions. And from there, they then died out completely. Uh, so now I think that um, there are some people in certain parts of East Anglia that have tried to revive uh, Plough Monday customs. Um, but but they, they were not very important in their day. And you know, some customs, I think, you know, they ought to just die out. You know, I mean, like they had their time, and now, and now we do other things. But if, you know, if you want to do it, that's fine. What I do on Plough Monday is I make something that has some kind of reference to plowing in it. And the most common dish that I make on Plough Monday is Norfolk plough pudding. And I'll show you some video of it here. First of all, here's um, a couple of samples of, of Norfolk puddings in, in, in the past. And now here's the actual construction of this year's pudding. All right, so we'll start here with the uh, beginnings of the filling for the uh, plough pudding, which is one onion, one leek, and some sage, and olive oil, and just a little gentle simmering to soften everything up. This is the beginning, then we're going to add meats, which will be some belly pork, some minced pork, and some sausage meat. You can see uh, I'm trying to combine everything together here and I'm just softening things, that's all. I'm not trying to give anything any colour, uh, just uh, getting the process started. So from here on I'm going to be switching a little bit between stills and video just because of certain technical issues, especially when I get to making the, the uh, pastry that surrounds the pudding because uh, I'm going to be using my food processor and making a lot of noise and so forth. And also just because it's difficult to maneuver my camera around the uh, workspace. Anyway. Here then is the finished uh, leek and onion mixture which I'm going to set aside and I'm going to start working on the meat portion of the filling uh, beginning with some belly pork. Okay now here you could uh, use bacon um, uh, or any kind of uh, belly pork. This is, um, this is a, just a standard belly pork without any uh, salt or smoke or whatever. So not really quite bacon yet. I've added some garlic, and now I'm also going to add a little bit of um, minced pork. I'm just going to try down the the belly pork first. I'm going to put it on low because I don't want it to colour the, the garlic that I put in here too much. But I want to just give a little bit of colour to the to the belly pork and now I'm going to add the um, minced pork. Now, I'm not sure, it might be a little bit frozen uh, so I'll have to see. Yeah, let's 
tiny bit frozen, but it's all out quickly enough, and I'll uh, I'll put it on slightly higher heat just to get it moving along. All right, so uh, I've added some sausage meat and I'm just going to heat that up a little bit. I'm not going to do much with it. But I want to add a tiny bit of broth. Not a lot, just uh, enough to moisten things a little bit. And then we'll get on with making the, the pastry to go around it. So there's the there's the broth. It's going to heat it through. Heat everything through. It's all going to be cooked in the steamer in the end anyway. Not like I have to fully cook it all here. But I'm going to do the best I can you know, really, really spice it, the sage. I really want to have it nice and spicy. All right, I'm just going to let that bake down a little bit. And let's move over to the food processor, which is my great pride and joy since Christmas. And I'm going to make these what should be uh, suet pudding surrounds but I'm actually not going to use suet because I can't get it I'm going to use butter and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that but I'll show you the, the basics so let's get to it and now that I've sauteed down all the meats the last part of the process of making the filling is obviously to combine the leeks and onions that I cooked originally with the meats which I'm, I've got here and just give them a little bit of a heat through and then we'll be ready to fill up the pudding crust. Now steamed uh, suet pudding is a very old traditional uh, British way of uh, making a steak and kidney pudding uh, a, a, just a plain kidney pudding actually. Um, um, in this case, the Norfolk pudding is uh, made in exactly the same way. That is, you're gonna have to make a, a suet pastry and line a pudding dish with it, fill it with the mixture, uh, top it up um, and then um, steam it. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through those steps. First of all uh, you have to make the uh, the suet pastry and uh, as I've said in previous videos I can't get suet. I, I really wish I could because it makes a meatier pastry. I have to use butter and uh, it works out okay. It's, it's fine but it doesn't have that robust uh, strong meatiness to it. And what I do is I mix together about one and a half cups of strong flour with half a cup of butter, which has been chopped. And then I put it in my food processor and um, spin it around for about 10 seconds until it looks like uh, kind of grainy sand. And then with the food processor on, a slowly trickle water in, perhaps not much more than a few tablespoons full. You, you can't really know until you actually do it. It's not a fixed quantity. You dribble the water in and it makes eventually a, a ball of, of pastry. Um, and then uh, uh, what you do is you take it out, roll out about two thirds of it and line uh, your um, your pudding dish 
with the pastry. And in this case, what I did was I had some um, aluminium foil, which I laid out flat, and I and I rolled and and spread out the pastry on it flat. And the thing is, you want to get the pastry fairly thin. It's very easy to get it really thick, and then you end up with a, a balance um, of pastry and filling, which is a little bit too heavy on the filling side. You want to try to keep the, the pastry thin. And so once it's been pressed out and, and flat, uh, then you put it inside the pudding dish and make sure that it's all even uh, all around and then fill up with your your filling mix of meat and onions and leeks and then take the final third of the pastry that you've kept aside roll that out and use it as the top uh, it will eventually be the bottom when you turn out the pastry uh, of the pudding but for the moment it's the top you crimp it all down cover up with the aluminium foil and place in a steamer and then steam for anywhere between three and a half uh, to four and a half hours um, judgment call I usually do it for about four hours something like that a little longer won't hurt um, but I wouldn't do too much shorter than that and then you turn it out and uh, in this case um, I used a, a rather wider basin than I normally use so it was a little bit um, flatter than normal um, a bit surprising I should have I, I should have used one of my regular pudding pans but I I couldn't because it was in the fridge with other Christmas stuff so I had to use this one and it was a little flatter still fine still fine everything turned out wonderful I, I made some more buttered leeks and because I always like to place the pudding on uh, a bed of buttered leeks and then sliced it up and went to town now I, I also commonly make a plowman's lunch and the plowman's lunch used to be fairly standard pub fare in England when I was a teenager uh, nowadays pubs um, not not during COVID but um, in normal times pubs have a full menu um, but back when I was a boy it's very hard to get pub food um, uh, but the plowman's lunch was fairly common the plowman's lunch consisted of some bread some butter um, and some cheese and usually a um, something else maybe it's a, a little bit of Branson pickle or um, a pickled onion or something like that but just basically bread and cheese and that's because plowmen used to take bread and cheese into the field as their lunch and there's a lot of um, talk um, but also back when when I was um, a young man about the size of the piece of cheese <laughs> And, and the size of the piece of bread. When you think that the plowman went out to the fields at sunup and, and by midday was pretty hungry. So that the plowman's lunch that you might get in a pub, which would be maybe like one uh, roll and a small piece of cheese, would not be enough to keep a plowman satisfied for the rest of the day until he got home to have his his supper but I what I usually do and again this is not I mean it doesn't look anything like what a plowman would eat I usually find the nicest cheeses that I can get hold of the nicest bread some nice pickle or pickled onions or something like that and make up a plowman's lunch plate like the ones that are shown here Or one year I made an oxtail stew and this is this is what it looks like um, I found some oxtails they're also very hard to come by in Cambodia but you do get them now and again 
and it's wonderful meat. I, I, I make oxtail soup if I can, oxtail stew if I can, when I can find them, which is very rare. You have to sear the oxtail and then poach it for hours and hours and hours with onions, celery and carrots. And then after it's all been simmered for maybe half a day, you take the bones out, take the meat off the bones, put them back in, maybe add a little bit of thickener and serve up the stew. And it's one of my favorite dishes. Served on Plough Monday because in both East Anglia and in Sussex they used oxen as their draft animals for pulling the ploughs. So that's Plough Monday and that's my cooking traditions. Now this staff day is extremely difficult to uncover information about because it, it just basically was very localized and um, and I'm not particularly interested in it because it doesn't involve food. <laughs> uh, it could be the day after Epiphany, January 7th, or it could be the day after Plough Monday. And it was the day that women supposedly had the day off, just like men have Plough Monday off, then women have Distaff Day off. Distaff, of course, being the, the, the kind of um, drop spindle that you use to spin um, wool with. And uh, distaff is actually a general metaphor for female. Like if you talk about the distaff line of ancestors, you're talking about mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and so forth. You're following the female line, or what we would call the matra line. So distaff day really means woman's day. This stuff Tuesday, Woman's Tuesday. What did they do? Well, it was kind of like a day of pranks. And they particularly play pranks on men, <laughs> but they could also play pranks on one another. And so it was kind of like an April Fool's Day, if you like, but just for women. But you had to like <laughs> watch your step if you're a man, because you, you might get caught up in their pranking. So that's the immediate aftermath of Epiphany. And now we're going to head off into that long period, theoretically, of carnival from now until March 1st. And there aren't a lot of celebrations in between, so I don't want to just repeat all my stuff about carnival yet again, but there are some saints days, there are some festivals in between, and we'll talk about them. And I may also just talk about calendar customs in general, we'll see. But anyway, have a good week, enjoy this period between Epiphany and Lent, and have a wonderful carnival season. I will see you on Friday.